Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, everybody, for this kind invitation to come and give the lecture, which is a great honour. Um, I'm going to begin with uh, some short vignettes by way of introducing this seemingly, perhaps seemingly, paradoxical topic of mysticism and social justice. Here's vignette number one. On February the 7th, 1934, the New Haven Railroad Company provided special train carriages for New Yorkers to attend a startling new opera being premiered at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. Anyone who was anyone in the New York artistic world was on that train, commented the writer Breyer. Titled Four Saints in Three Acts, uh, the opera had many more than four saints, some of them made up, like St. Settlement and St. Plan. I'm just going to pull out the draw here and then you can see a picture from it. Uh, but central to it was St. Teresa of Avila. In fact, the opera had two St. Teresas of Avila, one a contralto, the other a soprano, and they sang duets. The opera was a collaboration between the American Jewish Paris-based writer Gertrude Stein who produced a typically Steinian libretto full of playful, repetitive phrase, phrases, and the American composer Virgil Thompson, who had first knocked on her door in Paris in 1927 and said, can we collaborate? The young Frederick Ashton was the choreographer, an American painter, Florine Stettheimer, made and designed 200 costumes and scenery made of deeply flammable uh, material, which caused health and safety problems even then. And the choir director was Eva Jesse. Oh, I'm sorry, she comes up later in the pictures. Eva Jesse, who was a, a very important choral director in New York. Radically for the time, the entire cast of singers and dancers was African-American. It was an exuberant modernist extravaganza breaking all the contemporary rules of music, literature, and performance. And the reviews were superlative, an overwhelming and inescapable success, wrote the New York Times. And the opera soon went to Broadway and then on to Chicago. Stein was not the only iconic queer female writer of the early 20th century to be fascinated by Teresa of Avila. Nearly a decade after Four Saints had had its wildly successful premiere, the British writer, Vita Sackville West, published a double biography of two Carmelite Theresas, the 16th century Therese of Avila and the 19th century Therese of Lisieux, titled The Eagle and the Dove, a study in contrasts. I'll leave you to work out which is the eagle and the dove. <laughs> the book was a huge success and the initial print run of 8,000 had to be repeated within three days. In 1921, my next vignette, a 40-year-old white British man named Stephen Hoppas, and I have no definite photograph of him, sorry, who had not only embraced voluntary poverty at an early age, but had also been in prison during World War I for being a conscientious objector, and was now a huge uh, reformer of prisons because of that, was at a friend's house and took down a volume of the late mystical writings of William Law, an 18th century Anglican, a largely forgotten figure at the time. Hoppas was immediately captivated by his work, remained so, and did his best to make Law much more widely known. Law's mystical theology was so compelling to him because of its emphasis on the God of love. After his prison experience, Hoppas was trying to work out a God who was not punishing, and he found that in Law. A few years later, on this side of the Atlantic in the late 1920s, an African-American Baptist pastor in Ohio named Howard Thurman also picked up a book that was life-changing. This book was a copy of Finding the Trail of Life by the Quaker scholar Rufus Jones on sale at a church jumble sale. He bought it for a dime. Reading it was a turning point in Thurman's life and he said, if this man were alive, I wanted to study with him, which he did, going to Harvard College where Rufus Jones taught in 1929 for a semester. As a child, Thurmond had had mystical experiences while walking along the beach in Florida, where he had grown up, and a sense of the unity of all things. Going to Haverford, he learned about not only the Roman Catholic mystics, but also the Quaker way of faith. He said of this period later, I was trying to find out where I was in my own thinking and what on earth is mysticism? And little by little, 
I began to discover that what I was talking about I had known all my life, but it had not been defined or made articulate in any way. I'll explore these people and their stories a bit more in a moment, but first some background or context. First of all, I want to give you a, a very rough definition of a mystic because it's something that's always contested. I'm going to say it's someone who experiences a form of union with the divine, either as a result of methodical prayer or meditational practice or spontaneously. And I think that's a definition that everyone I'm talking about could have agreed with. The backdrop to all of this is that the early 20th century witnessed a revival of mysticism in both Britain and the US. And there were foundational texts written by W.R. Ing in Britain in 1899, a book called Christian Mysticism. Evelyn Underhill's book, Mysticism, 1911, which was published uh, then and has never been out of print since. And of course, on this side of the Atlantic, not only Rufus Jones, but William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, which explored mysticism in that context. Print culture was absolutely vital to all of this. Ing wrote in 1913, to those who can observe the signs of the time and the deeper currents of contemporary thought, nothing appears more significant than the rapid increase of interest in mysticism, which means the religion of direct personal religious experience. Books on mysticism are now pouring from the presses, and some of them are sold by the thousand. The historian Matthew Hedstrom has written about the importance of print culture for cultivating a liberal and engaged Christianity in early 20th century America, and indeed Rufus Jones was central to that enterprise. Books about mystics led to reprints of books by mystics, which had long been only in manuscript form or in Latin or out of print. Some of the reading public attracted to all of this were devout, some were seekers on the edges of religion. And in many ways, this revival was not only a revival. It was about the making of mysticism. It created the narrative we have today about mysticism. It also particularly recognized Protestant mystics, Reformation and post-Reformation figures, and of course the importance of reading plays into all of that. Because of this early 20th century revival, mysticism as we know it and have received it has a particular relationship with the modern period itself in a couple of ways. Here's the first. While many historians and sociologists tell a story of secularization, in Britain especially, in terms of declining church attendance across the century, they have largely ignored the broad enthusiasm for and curiosity about what we'll call spirituality, often untethered from institutional religion. So the return to the mystics and their writings really is a kind of sign of this search for meaning. The atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell summed this up in an essay in 1912, quote, the decay of traditional religious beliefs bitterly bewailed by upholders of the churches, welcomed with joy by those who regard the creeds as mere superstition, and he would have said that of himself, is an undeniable fact. Yet when the dogmas, dogmas have been rejected, the question of the place of religion in life is by no means decided. People still seek a quality of infinity which seems to give an insight deeper than the piecemeal knowledge of our daily life. And the prevailing theme amongst all the writers on mysticism was a sense that mysticism itself was that quality of infinity. Both Ing and Underhill described it as the very essence of religion. Aldous Huxley, writing in the 1940s, described it as the perennial philosophy. In her biography of the two Theresas, Peter Sackville West tapped into that quality of infinity as she explored the question, what is mysticism? And it's a, it's a very interesting biography because she goes along talking about Theresa in a roughly chronological manner, not always. Uh, it's thematic too. But then she'll have a kind of little excursus where she says, oh, what is mysticism? Why are people mystics? And so on. And you can feel her answering, asking those questions herself because she too was a seeker. She wrote, I am not myself what is called a religious person in the orthodox sense of the phrase, I do, however, confronted with the ultimate enigma, believe and believe deeply in some mysterious central originating force. And she thought that mysticism was nothing less than the absolute, the ultimate reality with no boundary beyond which we can further probe. 
Even silence in all its forms is presumably finite. But this, this other is transcendent and all-embracing, in a sense, denied to all other expression. The second way in which I think mysticism is deeply tied to the modern period is its relationship to modernism, the literary and artistic movement so epitomized by Stein's Four Saints. And I won't say too much about this today, but just that modernism may have broken with the old in many ways, creating new forms in the visual arts and literature, but in doing so, it also witnessed, I think, a wider attempt to find that which was eternal and transcendent. The effects of this were felt in many artistic quarters. And just to give you one example, I think that without the work of an unassuming Scottish Presbyterian independent scholar named Grace Warwick, who produced the first modern edition of Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love in 1900, the edition everyone read until the 1960s, the line, all shall be well, probably wouldn't have made it into T.S. Eliot's four quartets. So my current research project is on the early 20th century revivers, discoverers, and makers of the mystics. And they are church people and non-affiliated spiritual seekers, university academics and independent scholars, modernist writers and artists, and pursuers of justice. It is a history of the 20th century that nevertheless is in some ways a history of mysticism, so it's quite, quite large. And I want to try and give you a sense of some of the characters uh, that I've introduced you to through the lecture, how they searched for meaning, and how they wanted to find uh, and make a better world. So therefore, this is par seeming paradox between mysticism and social justice isn't paradoxical to them, and it also provides them with a practice which supports their activism, which I hope uh, you will, will become apparent as we go. So let me now return to um, Gertrude Stein and the Theresas and Vita Sackville West. Why on earth was Teresa of Avila an inspiration to Stein and Sackville West? Gertrude Stein was not interested at all in the details of Teresa of Avila's life, but when Virgil Thompson, the composer, asked her to write the libretto of an opera for him, she made Teresa and indeed Ignatius of Loyola the main subjects because she simply said, they're my two favorite saints. Why she, a Jewish woman, had favorite Christian saints, I do not know. <laughs> Her partner, Alice B. Toklas, happened to love Avila. They stayed there for 10 days in 1912, and we thoroughly enjoyed it, Gertrude wrote, though she was pining for their parents' apartment. The opening of the opera is startling with a roll of drums. I hope I might have a slide here. Here we go. Uh, a roll of drums. And St. Teresa the First, in purple, played by Beatrice Robinson Wayne, stands on stage as a chorus of saints and angels sings, to know, to know, to love her so, for saints prepare for saints, it makes it well fish, for saints it makes it well fish, which is nonsensical. It evokes her interest in St. Teresa, but also her love for Alice. It prepares the audience for what was to come, no coherent narrative, but a playful, repetitive libretto full of apparent nonsense sung to Virgil Thompson's exuberant music. And Thompson, in setting the libretto to music, depended purely on the sounds of Stein's words and was inspired, interestingly, by medieval liturgical chant, which had been, of course, tied to the sounds of the Latin. So he went back to that for inspiration. I'm going to play you a little tiny, tiny bit so you can get a sense of it. Um, Stein described the opera as a landscape in which many parts are represented simultaneously. The viewer discovers it piece by piece. She wrote, I made the saints the landscape. All the saints that I made, and I made a number of them because after all, a great many pieces of things are in a landscape. All these saints together made my landscape. There is no punctuation in that sentence, by the way. The opera was an experience. Stein's libretto, like all of her writing, was designed to be an experience of word constructions. And she responded to those who said they could not understand it. If you enjoy it, you understand it. Here she is talking about it. And I was very surprised by the fact that she doesn't have a deeper voice than she does. Let's see what you think. After all, when you say they do not understand for a thing, what do you mean? Of course they understand, or they would not listen to it. 
You mean by understanding that you can talk about it in the way that you have the habit of talking, putting it in other words. But I mean by understanding enjoyment. If you enjoy it, you understand it. The cast of the first production rehearsed here at the historic black church, St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Harlem. And the renowned choral director, Ava Jesse, was in charge of the singers. Uh, they were absolutely vital uh, uh, to the whole opera and her collaboration with the white and gay and male, Ashton Thompson, was also vital. In turn, Jessie recognized that the opera was influential upon her choir. Singing for Saints was, she said, quite a departure because up to that time, the only opportunities involved you know, things like Swanee River. They called that our music and thought we could sing those things only by the gift of God. With this opera, we had to step on fresh ground. So the result of all of this is that people felt it was an enormous success because it was exuberant and because it spoke of a fully inclusive America, a new national culture, to New York art critics put it. Breyer, the writer, described it as one of the most triumphant nights I have ever spent watching a stage. Gertrude's text soared out magnificently and with it, her and our rebellion against worn out art. So the opera was boundary breaking, and that's, that fits with mystics, right? Mystics aren't necessarily boundary breaking, always. That's why the churches are always trying to contain them. So it's not surprising that, you know, that the artistic world tried to gatekeep uh, the modernists in many ways, in the way the churches have tried often to gatekeep mystics. Both Stein and Sackville West indeed likened saints and mystics to artists. And Sackville West wrote, that, I think I've got this on a slide, that, yes, the condition of the artist in the moments of creative inspiration, the fine frenzy, is closely comparable to the rapture of the mystic, that the two experiences, in fact, are similar in their nature, though perhaps not consciously in their aim. But here, then she goes on to say, the mystics themselves have dwelt on the hopelessness of the attempt to translate their experience into intelligible words. Like the poet, they must take refuge in symbol or metaphor, more potent than dry affirmations, more evocative than statement. I shall have to make use of a comparison, writes Saint Teresa. I should like to avoid it, but the language of spirituality is so difficult of utterance. Sackville West was herself an artist, not only a writer, but a fantastic gardener. Here's one of the many gardens in her house. It's a whole series of gardens. Here's the White Garden. Um, and uh, she became very famous for her gardens as well as her writing. And in fact, her diary entries often go along these lines. Alone all day, garden and St. Teresa, mostly St. Teresa. As soon as she had finished the book, at top speed in six months, while in fact on speed, according to her biographer, Victoria Glendinning, she worked in the garden by moonlight until midnight. But what really sparked Sackville West's interest in her two Theresas was their strangeness. That's what she talks about all the time. In 1937, she had visited Lisieux in France with her lover, Gwen St. Aubin. Gwen had found Lisieux meaningful and the next year converted to Roman Catholicism. But Sackville West thought it a strange place. The experience compelled her to make sense of mystics and saints for her contemporaries, people like her, not a believer in any orthodox sense. Understanding saints was, she wrote to her husband, Harold Nicholson, rather like trying to grasp relativity and every now and then getting a flash of understanding. It is such a totally different world and the first point to understand is that all ordinary values are reversed. Six years after visiting Lisieux, she wrote the book, always preferring the eagle, Teresa of Avila, who was, quote, really irresistible, so very autocratic and un-nun-like, a grand woman. She saw herself reflected in her, though noted to Harold that Teresa would have flung herself with absolute gusto into sorting out ongoing domestic issues that she was facing, such as a missing pie dish in a way that she couldn't. Many of us know Teresa Ravala for her mystical raptures, uh, not least because of a sculpture by Bernini, uh, which I'm sure will be famous to you all. And in a way, there's an irony to this because there was so much more to her. She was an immensely capable reformer of her order. She was a spiritual advisor to many and a distinguished 
theologian. But the raptures made some of uh, the early 20th century people really dismiss her. William James is highly dismissive of her. Uh, so was W.R. Ng. And what's quite lovely about Sackville Rest's biography is that she's really trying to understand what makes the mystic. And, and she realizes that what makes the mystic is not necessarily of the mystic's making. Vessels of grace, she says, are apparently arbitrarily chosen. Sackville West didn't probe into the purpose and fruits of the raptures, the religious experiences, but Teresa herself did. Advising her nuns, she wrote that if the fruits of forgiveness and pardon of injury do not happen after the, whole, the soul has had such a rapture, then the experiment has not come from God. Such ecstatic experiences must bear fruit, and Teresa's did throughout her life. In short, it was quite clear for Teresa that mysticism was and must be associated with our actions in the world. So now to our second set of people, Stephen and Rosa Hobhouse and William Law. After Stephen Hobhouse and Rosa War married in the Quaker Meeting House in Westminster on May the 15th, 1915, they had a two hour honeymoon. They strolled around Hyde Park and caught the bus home to the east end of London. It wasn't that they needed to catch a bus or have such a truncated honeymoon, but they chose to. They were both in their mid-30s by the time they married, and they had each, long before meeting, deliberately decided to pursue an ascetic life of voluntary poverty and political activism. From Hyde Park, they returned to Hoxton, a poor area of London, quote, to start our life in Enfield buildings tenement building, a bit like this. These, we noted with amusement, were built for the industrious classes to which we hoped we might belong. Stephen Hobhouse, and I told you I don't have a definite photograph of him, but I think, here, here he is with his family, I think he's the person on the front on the right. Stephen Hobhouse came from a wealthy and well-connected family, but in his youth he read Leo Tolstoy's radical Christian text, and renounced his family wealth, and as the eldest son, his inheritance of the family estate had been in Somerset in southwest England, which is now a luxury hotel if you want to experience what he gave up. Here it is. Quite a change from the East End tenement. Rosa War uh, was an artist and a poet described by Sylvia Pankhurst, her fellow suffragette, as having a mystic's temperament. And this is and quite a lot of people uh, painted her and sketched her at the Slade School of Art uh, because there was a radical group of female artists who didn't want to use working class women unless they could be really paid well as models so they would sit themselves if necessary. And here is a little sketch, here's a sketch of her by, by herself, which is rather sweet in a letter. Um, they had joined, uh, Rosa, Rosa War, ha help us, had joined with someone called Muriel Lester, also a, a well, from a wealthy family, to form a very radically egalitarian settlement house in the east end of London. And um, they used Evelyn Underhill's writings as, as, as their prayer life there. They were both Quakers by choice, Stephen and Rosa. Stephen's family was Anglican. Rosa's father had been a Congregationalist minister who founded the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Theirs was a marriage of love, shared faith and values, and Stephen used the language of mysticism to describe it just before their wedding. He wrote, I pray that I might be bound up with you in that mystic marriage of Christ, which is ours. The love of me, which God has given you, is still too wonderful for me to grasp. In their adoption of voluntary poverty, they were part of a group of radical left Christians who believed that, quote, in scrubbing their own floors, they could change the world, as the historian Seth Coven has put it. They were inspired by the Sermon of the Mount and the theology of God as love, and they sought, as they put it, to reconcile East and West, rich and poor, white and black, men and women. They wanted to move on from the paternalistic, philanthropic model of their parents' generation to a radically egalitarian mode of living. As Muriel Lester, who was one of the co-founders of the Kingsley Settlement House, Kingsley Hall Settlement House said, it isn't enough to give away money. We feel we have no right to possess it in the first place. 
when several of them issued their manifesto on voluntary poverty, the newspapers were fascinated by the seemingly motley collection of heirs, heiresses, clergy, and workers who signed it. And they published a photograph of Rosa Hophouse shockingly doing her own ironing in her tenement flat. What both Stephen and Rosa articulated was, this is their language, a self-identification with the oppressed. Several decades before the Roman Catholic liberation theologians and Paolo Freire talked about choosing, uh, uh, advocating a preferential option for the poor. Nevertheless, Rosa was aware that choosing voluntary poverty was a privilege in itself, a distinct difference from the injustice of being poor. As she put it, it was impossible to claim that our sharing in their outward circumstances even approached the inner reality of our neighbor's experiences. As Quakers, they were pacifists and had been anti-war activists before they'd met each other. So it's no surprise when they did meet, that they spent all night talking, they walked back to the East End together and were married six weeks later at a festive wedding attended by family, friends and friends and many of their German protégés because the work they were both involved with in the middle of the war was looking after, caring for, and ensuring that German residents were safe in the country. But befriending Germans and defending them against mob violence didn't win them any friends, nor did their campaigning for, pre for peace and against conscription in the jingoistically patriotic culture of Britain in those early years of the war. Soon after their marriage, Rosa was jailed for three months for distributing pacifist leaflets, on the grounds that she had violated the Defense of the Realm Act, dissuading young men from joining up. She rose to the occasion. She spoke in her own defense at the trial. She was given a fine of 50 pounds and refused to believe she'd done anything wrong, so she was thrown into prison instead, and she used her time in prison to preach God's love and ask for a copy of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. The following year, in 1916, when conscription was introduced, Stephen was arrested for failing to respond to his call-up papers. In court, he said that as a follower of Christ, he could take no part in work for war or work imposed by a military service act. That meant he was a completely absolutist, conscientious objector and wouldn't do anything like drive an ambulance or the other kinds of things that were allowed to conscientious objectors. So he went to prison for a year. The experience of being in prison wrecked his already precarious health and led him to become an advocate of prison reform and an advocate of the writings, as I've already said, of the mystic William Law, immediately attracted by their spiritual beauty and ready wit. At first glance, it may seem surprising that this socialist Quaker found the high church Anglican William Law of such interest, but they were both conscientious objectors. I have to go back for a moment to a little bit of 18th century history. William Law was an Anglican clergyman and a fellow at uh, Cambridge, a Cambridge College, Emmanuel. He would have had a pretty standard career, I think, in the church and in academia, except in 1716, Queen Anne died. And instead of bringing in a Stuart king, this is a little bit of history, sorry, uh, they got a soundly Protestant king from Germany, George I. So they broke the Stuart line of succession. And he was what's called a non-juror. He would not uh, swear an oath of allegiance to that king because the line of succession had been broken. So he left the church and academia. He wrote a pretty important book called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life in 1729, very influential upon the young Wesley brothers. But increasingly, he wanted to live a more devout and scholarly life, which he did with two serious ladies, a spinster and a widow. And they lived for 29 years until Law's death in 1761, a life of prayer, study, and charitable works. He was clearly already a person of aesthetic habits. One coffeehouse companion described him, quote, as terribly perplex perplexed with scruples, always uneasy, wearing a pair of stockings that a plowman wouldn't have picked off a dunghill. <laughs> He'd always been interested in the medieval mystics. Now he taught himself German to read the complex 17th century German mystic Jakob Burma and produced a series of books about mysticism in the 1750s. The Wesley brothers turned against him and 
We'll see why in a moment. They didn't like his mysticism at all, and nor did the reasonable Anglicans. Hophouse's experience of prison, which he wrote about in a book called An English Prison from Within, which is very, it's a short book, it's very moving, led him to wrestle with questions of sin and forgiveness, judgment and punishment. And so he was deeply attracted to Law's mystical theology because it was about punishment and consequence. He wrote, Law insists that God in himself as a person is always ready to forgive and always free from anger and any desire to punish. While divine retribution or punishment, so-called, is only the unraveling of the dreadful consequences of sin in oneself or in others, which tends to produce more and more misery and sin, so that Christians, imitators of Christ, ought not to take part in any acts of retributive justice. This, these words spoke directly to Stephen's experience of prison, which was characterized, he said, by an almost complete absence of trust in the honor or obedience of the prisoner, so that the warders and governor rule not by love, but by fear, which punishment and the threat to punish inspired, sorry, that sentence didn't make sense. The warders and governor rule not by love, but by fear. Punishment and the threat to punish inspire the regulations which hang on the wall of each cell. Every step and action is watched and spied upon. One rule was to keep silent. You couldn't speak to each other as prisoners. Stephen deliberately broke that rule and, quote, personally took every opportunity of exchanging cheerful greetings and scraps of news with my companions in misfortune. Apart from the much needed outlet for self-expression, it seemed a religious duty to pass on words of cheer and interest. For that, he was put into solitary confinement, 23 hours out of 24 in his cell for the last four months that he was in prison. That this caused no permanent damage, he said, and attributed to the spiritual equipment with which I was providentially, thanks to my past life, endowed. Set apart from the others, he prayed for them, though he felt that prayer without scope for action is woefully inadequate. It's not surprising then that he, out of prison, picking up this book from the bookcase, found Law's God of Love and Theology of Universal Salvation deeply moving. No one was going to be punished in the afterlife in Law's theology. And Hophouse was struck that Law came to this position after a long period of prayer and meditation. After Law's nine years, this is uh, Hophouse speaking of Law, after Law's nine years of silent reflection, it is delightful to see him emerging into the sunshine of universalism and tacitly ignoring the harsh inconsistencies of his German teacher, Jacob Burma, as well as those of the New Testament text. The redemption of all men, as well as of the fallen spirits, is either implied or is a happy probability or actually asserted. There's a very deep mystical sense to Law's articulation of that universal salvation. He wrote, there is but one salvation for all mankind, sick, and that is the life of God and the soul. God has but one design or intent towards all mankind, and that is to introduce or generate his own life, light, and spirit in them. You'll see great resonances here with the Quakers and with Howard Thurman. Law believed that there was one possible way for man to attain this salvation, or life God in the soul, and that is quite simply the desire, the desire of the soul turned to God. As soon as you express that desire, that you want God, it's it, that's it, you're saved for law. The desire itself does everything. It brings the soul to God and God to the soul, it unites with God, it cooperates with God, and is one life with God. It was this theology that made John Wesley turn against law. Quote, if there be no unquenchable fire, no everlasting burnings, there is no dependence on the script. There is no dependence on the scriptures. No hell, no heaven, no revelation. Wrote Wesley. Law responded very calmly. Such a view gave misguided reverence to the outward letter, to the threatenings of the law now superseded by the gospel of love. Like many mystics, Law had come to perceive, in the deepest sense, that a relationship with God relied on neither the institution nor the book. There was a form of Christianity, he said, which every man must first be made sensible of, not from hearsay, but as a growth or degree of life within himself. So the appeal to antiquity, to history, to ancient churches, that's in vain. 
you have to have that indwelling spirit of God living in you. In 1938, Hopp has published a volume of selections from Law's mystical writings with accompanying essays, which, which he tried to ex explicate Law's theology. He was very keenly aware he was not a theologian and described this as a task of love. One prominent figure who picked up an interest in the mystical law was the British writer Aldous Huxley, who wrote a preface to the revised second 1948 edition of that Hoppaz volume. By then, Huxley had published his perennial philosophy, 1944, claiming that it was, you know, mysticism was the perennial philosophy. But I thought you might like to see what he'd wrote about this as he was planning the book to his brother uh, Julian, because it's an, uh, that's Aldous Huxley. But here's what he wrote to his brother Julian. It's very interesting. Non-dogmatic religious mysticism is the only column and element at once theoretical and practical, speculative and devotional in the various religions of the world. Christianity as such can never hope to become the world religion because it has become associated in the eyes of all non-European peoples with the beastliness of our political and economic imperialism. This is 1942. But there is in all the religions of any degree of development this highest common factor of mysticism on which everybody can agree because it is empirical and does not depend on revelation or history. Mysticism also has the enormous merit of being concerned with the eternal present and not, as humanism is, with the future. The moment you get a religion which thinks primarily about the bigger and better future, as do all the political religions from communism and Nazism up to the at present harmless because organized, unorganized and powerless forms of humanism and utopianism, it runs the risk of becoming ruthless, of liquidating the people it happens to find conven convenient now for the sake of the people who are going, hypothetically, to be so much better and happier and more intelligent in the year 2000 of sacrificing the present to a future about which the one thing that can certainly be said is that we are totally incapable of foreseeing it accurately. An amazing bit of prose. He was writing in the middle of World War II, of course, and you can also, if you've read Brave New World, which he published 10 years earlier, you can feel echoes of that. He quoted Law a lot in the perennial philosophy because of this sort of sense of the God of love. And when in his introduction to the Hobhouse volume, he wrote impersonally about a question with which he had personally uh, long wrestled. Are mystics born or made? The, the, the same question Sackville West was prompted to ask as she tried to understand Therese of Avila. He felt that the evidence pointed to them being born, but surely he felt they could be made, though for many the road to the unitive knowledge of God may be horribly difficult. It seems impious to believe that the divine good pleasure has predestined the greatest number of men and women to inevitable and irredeemable failure. Here, Law's theology of salvation came to the rescue. Quote, this is Huxley writing about law now. If few are chosen, it is because consciously or unconsciously, few choose to be chosen. Then he quotes Law. God's kingdom must manifest itself with all its riches in the soul, which wills nothing else. If amongst all the multiplicity of wills, you return to and allow only this one will, that desire, you are returned to God and must find the blessedness of his kingdom within you. Huxley was indeed one for whom the road the, to the unity of knowledge of God was horribly difficult. He longed for it. He tried everything. Prayer, meditation, fasting, an ascetic way of life, sitting at the feet of Western teachers and Eastern gurus. In the end, he used mescaline and later LSD under a doctor's supervision. He didn't think this resulted in the unity of knowledge of God as experienced by mystics, but he did experience it as a doorway to the transcendence of self and an opening of the mind, which he called the mind at large, utterly transfiguring one's perception of the wider world. And you may have read the doors of perception, which he describes it. What of Hobhaus? Was he a mystic in his experiences, practices? I'm not sure. He doesn't talk about it, but he, doesn't talk ab he does talk about how law doesn't talk about it enough. He prayed regularly, as we know from his prison memoir, and he described in older age the story that the mystics have to tell us as soul animating. As a Quaker, he sought through silent reflection the inner light, and there was a strong connection between this and the revival of mysticism in the early 20th century, as my last example shows, and I'll now turn to that. 
At the beginning of this lecture, I related the story of Howard Thurman picking up a copy of a book by Rufus Jones. Rufus Jones was a really significant figure in the study of mysticism in the early 20th century for a couple of reasons. First, he understood, like William James, significance, the significance of the turn to individual authority. And secondly, he understood that Quakers had been doing this for a long time. And so he incorporated the Quakers into a kind of canon of Protestant mystics. He also understood the importance of nature mysticism and Quakers often had kind of nature mystic experiences. William James, when he wrote the Varieties of Religious Experience, used an example of George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, walking outside and suddenly having the word of the Lord beam to him, as it were, as his very first example. It's, a, it's paradigmatic for James. Of course, there's a long tradition in America with people like Emerson and Thoreau. It was this nature mysticism that really struck Howard Thurman. He loved reading the Roman Catholic mystics, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But that nature mysticism is what he'd experienced. Writing about his youth, he remembered that the ocean at night had given him a sense of timeliness, of existing beyond the reach of the ebb and flow of circumstances. Thurman described himself as a mystic of the light within, influenced by the Quakers, but he was also very inspired by the 13th century German Dominican Meister Eckhart, and he'd done an advanced seminar on Eckhart uh, with Rufus Jones. Eckhart's idea that there is an uncreated element in the soul of each human being, that is the God within, corresponded, of course, with the Quaker notion of the inner light. But even as Thurman read the mystics and found a language for his own personal spirituality, he struggled with the silence about race and racism, the other vital part of his life experience that he found amongst Jones and other white professors and students at Haverford College. Jones connected mysticism to activism. He was a huge pacifist. He traveled all over the world trying to bring about pacifism. He was a member of the Fellowship of Reconciliation as the Hophouses were, and as indeed Thurman himself was. But this silence about race was very perplexing and difficult for Thurman. He wrote that, I felt that somehow Jones transcended race. I did so too, temporarily. But Thurman knew that he could only transcend race for a little while. And after he had been studying at Haverford, he went to Atlanta and went to teach philosophy and religion at Morehouse and Spelman Colleges. In 1932, he moved to Howard University, where he was dean of the chapel and taught at the Divinity School, and there the social gospel was powerful and influential upon him. In 1935, he visited India, Ceylon, and Burma for six months with his wife and two others, and gave 135 speeches during his travels. But most importantly, he met and was influenced by Gandhi, and Gandhi's teachings on nonviolent protest were enormously important to him another affinity with Hophouse, who met Gandhi in London in 1931. So these encounters and experiences led Thurman to an understanding of the unity of all things, the basis of his mysticism and motivation for social and racial justice. Also the basis for an increasing emphasis on interreligious understanding. Mixing the Quaker notion of the abiding inner light with a quest for civil rights, while expanding Paul's vision of equality in Galatians 3.28, Thurman appealed to a divine presence in which, quote, there is neither male nor female, white nor black, Gentile nor Jew, Protestant nor Catholic, Hindu, Buddhist nor Muslim, but a human spirit stripped to the literal substance of itself. In 1944, he left Howard to co-found an interracial church, the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco, with a white Presbyterian minister, Alfred Fisk. The origins of this fellowship lay with some of his links in that fellowship of reconciliation of which Hophouse and indeed Muriel Lester, one of the Kingsley Hall people, if you remember, were involved. And it was actually Muriel Lester who came to America and spoke about Gandhi's uh, uh, nonviolent uh, direct action who, who suggested this church. Um, here is uh, Muriel Lester, just behind Gandhi, when she welcomed him to London in 1931. And there's a typical Cockney, the Cockneys are wearing 
uh, their pearly king and queen outfits, which I can explain later if you like. Um, so Thurman decided to leave his tenured position uh, and go off and found this, this church, the Fellowship Church, which was one of integration at every level. He was profoundly committed to this. And he also wanted to introduce them to the mystics. So he gave a sermon series in 1953 on men who walked with God. It included at least one woman. An introduction to some of his favorite mystics. Preaching on Eckhart, perhaps his favorite of the Roman Catholic mystics, he explained that particular theologian's concept of detachment as, of a, way, as a way of allowing the uncreated element, the Godhead at the core of each soul, to come to the fore. Detachment is necessary because attachments block the spread of the Godhead which is in us. So, quote, the only way by which you can precipitate this spread is by disentangling the self from all the things that commit the mind and commit the soul and involve the heart. And yet, Thurman wrote, Eckhart was ever the man of paradoxes. Here is Thurman on Eckhart's paradoxes. Now, he sounds as if he's altogether negative, but he isn't, for he says, he's full of surprises, he says that if a man is having the most profound kind of mystical experience, as St. Paul had when he was carried into the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, and there in the midst of that highly accentuated moment of divine awareness, he remembers that there's some man around the corner who's hungry, he'd better leave his mystical experience and go and feed him and then come back. And that's all right, isn't it? Taking Eckhart's theology of the undifferentiated Godhead at the core of every person's soul, Thurman took that to mean that I'm never permitted to say of another human being that he is anything that is a denial of the infinite worth of his personality because his personality is the basket in which is carried that priceless ingredient. So what he had a sense of is we all carry that and in all these face-to-face -face encounters we have, he was deeply committed to a sort of interreligious dialogue. My core, my un, you know, my God core, as it were, is, is to salute your God core. That's his language. Um, it was a theology that, that got Eckhart into trouble. That's another story. But it's certainly the theology that absolutely fueled the Fellowship Church in San Francisco with its meditation room containing a statue of the Buddha a painting of Gandhi by Thurman and sacred texts of all the major religions. But Thurman in the end made it clear that the direct relationship with God is it. That's what's essential. In a sermon preached in 1950, he said, the claim of the mystic is at last that you don't need anything to bring you to God. You don't need a mediator. You don't need an institution. You don't need a ceremony or a ritual. God is in me, and the ladder from the earth to the sky is available. So I can ascend my own altar stairs wherever I am under any circumstances. And the key to the understanding of the experience and to the experience itself is never in the hands of any other human being. In 1949, he talked a lot about experience and the importance of experience in what is his most famous book, Jesus and the Disinherited, in which he compared Jesus' situation as a poor Jew living under Roman occupation as one of the disinherited to the experiences of the disinherited of his own day, and in particular, he drew extensively on his own life as a black man living in a racist society. And it is in this book that he really ring, brings his passion as a mystic for crossing boundaries of difference to create new communities with that experience of racism to try and say we can all share a common godly core. Not everyone agreed with him, but that's what he was really saying. He said, of course he understood those who have their backs against the wall. That's a famous phrase in the book. Of course he understood that they were angry. But in the end, what he wanted to say is that that's deadly for the inner self, the godly core. The most powerful response to one's oppressor is to keep the spirit of that inner self thriving. He wrote, no external force, however great and overwhelming, can at long last destroy a people if it does not at first win the victory of the spirit against them. Love is essential, and the last chapter of the book is all about love, loving your enemy, being willing to forgive. In a sermon preached the year after Jesus and the disinherited came out, he said, 
when I love people, I find God in me. He always hoped that people were capable of spiritual transformation, and he firmly believed that spiritual transformation would lead to social and societal transformation. In 1953, he made his last move to Boston University, where he was the first black dean of Marsh, Cha Marsh Chapel. And those of you who have just thought about that date perhaps will remember that that was the last year in which Martin Luther King Jr. was a graduate student at BU. Thurman was a deeply important mentor to him. Thurman is the person who introduced Gandhi's idea of nonviolent protest to King. Uh, and here is a picture of King with a picture of Gandhi on the wall. Jesus and the Disinherited became an enormously important book to King, but also to many others in the civil rights movement. In fact, it was the must-read book along with the Bible. When, uh, in December 1955, King led the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, if you read his speech after reading Jesus and the Disinherited, you will see it's full of Thurman-esque phrases, and he had a copy of Jesus and the Disinherited in his pocket. In retirement, Thurman continued to teach about and advocate for the connection between mysticism and activism. In a set of lectures late in his life, he said that the mystic is under obligation to achieve the good which in some profound sense is given in the moment of vision. That's different from Therese of Avalar's sense that the test of the truth of a mystical experience is its fruits, but it brings the same ethical component to the experience itself. Douglas Van Steer, another white professor whom Jones had met at Haverford, wrote that Eckhart's lesson that you can only spend in good works what you have earned in contemplation must have lodged deeply in Howard's mind and spirit because it has been a theme song of his ever since. Let me briefly conclude. The story of the early 20th century revival, adoption and making of mysticism is part of a larger story of modern religion in the UK and the US, which I want to tell. While many historians and sociologists date the decline of religious observance and the rise of the spiritual but not religious phenomenon to the 1960s, a study of the early 20th century suggests it began much earlier. Already at that point, people were questioning institutional religion, even if some of them showed up to church on a Sunday or synagogue on a Friday. And many had that yearning for that quality of infinity. Some found it in the huge number of alternative spiritualities that were on offer, whether it's theosophy or yoga. But many people found it in a study of the mystics and the attempt to have a personal encounter with the divine. This suggests that the Christian tradition and indeed the mystical tradition of other religions, though they have not been my focus today, may offer our generation resources for the spiritual journey in surprising ways. In 2011, the writer Jeanette Winterson, some of you may know her novels, reflecting on her childhood experience in a narrow and inward-looking Pentecostalist church in her memoir with the brilliant title, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, concluded, the Western world has done away with religion, but not with our religious impulses. We seem to need some higher purpose, some point to our lives. Money and leisure, social progress are just not enough. We shall have to find new ways of finding meaning. It's not yet clear how this will happen. And that's, to me, a sort of companion piece to Bertram Russell talking about the quality of affinity in 1912, about 100 years before. You heard from Andrew that I um, have written about Gen Z, uh, and I'm interested that they are often skeptical about religious institutions, all institutions. Um, we can talk about why if you like, but authenticity is absolutely key for Gen Zers, and they can sniff out inauthenticity from a mile off. And relying on their own experience is also key, and the authority of that experience is natural to them. This reliance on experience and the quest for authenticity is exactly what drew so many in the early 20th century to the mystics, a recurring theme amongst the several people I've discussed today. So, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that the mystics are the answer to a declining church. Sorry, I don't have a, a bullet that answers everything there. I am saying that this quest for the quality of infinity, this trust in self and skepticism about the institutional church, has been around for a lot longer than we usually think. Those who explored the mystical life over the course of the 20th century might well have something to teach us as we search for spiritual transformation and a more just world, 
and the practices they used might just support our work in that too. Thank you. Volker Lepin, teaching a historical Christianity here and now uh, doing some stuff uh, also about mysticism. So I, I, what, what you said was resonating uh, deeply with what uh, I'm looking for in my historical research. Um, and it made me somehow optimistic because uh, as a German and as a Lutheran looking at exactly the same time, first half of the 20th century, I have a totally different reception, especially of Meister Eckert, the most popular uh, work receiving Master Eckhart in that time was Alfred Rosenberg, Mythos des 20. Jahrhunderts, written in 1929 and being the ideological basis for the Nazis. And ah. then Lutheran theologians say uh, that the Deutsche Christen would receive Master Eckhart and would uh, interpret Martin Luther as a mystic, as I do, and this is a problem for me to, to read those authors. Uh, so against this background, um, do, do you see in the tradition you are researching on a, in the English-speaking tradition anything like this dangerous, perilous reception of mysticism, or, or is it all in that track uh, as you showed to us? Great question. Um, uh, I was just, while you were speaking there, well, I was thinking about the fact that I think Robert Musil read Meister Eckhart and it influenced the man without qualities. So a slightly, that slightly different track there, maybe, I don't know, that offers you optimism and hope. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I don't know of any, but now you've asked me the question, I'm going to go looking. Um, yeah, that, no. I, I mean, there are, of course, conservative church people. I mean, this is wrapped up with, in the Church of England, there's, it's, there's, this is when the retreat movement gets going, that comes out of Anglo-Catholicism. Um, so, yes, there are some conservative church people who get engaged in this. But I wouldn't say it has that kind of movement uh, that, that you're talking about it would be more church contained than politically conservative. I don't know of political conservatives who use the mystics in this way, but I'm now going to go looking. Um, if I find any, I'll tell you. Thank you. It's a great, wonderful question for me and my research. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, um, I was wondering if Vita would... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Jane Pothast. I'm a student in religion and literature. Um, I was wondering if Vita Sackville West would have seen Virginia or some of the other Bloomsbury group as having mystic impulses in their own writing. That's a great question. Um, uh, people are starting to work on the mystic impulses in Virginia Woolf's writing, actually. Uh, there are a couple of people writing on that, which you may have read. I don't know whether Vita Sackville West did, but um, I might be able to tell you soon because I'm going to go and read her papers. Uh, uh, her letters to Virginia Woolf. So that might help me. Maybe you know the answer. Um, I mean, you know, Virginia Woolf was, was, was apparently deeply secular. I mean, she was horrified by T.S. Eliot's conversion, as you will know. Um, but um, th there are these senses that she has a kind of my my mystical and a kind of sort of slightly airy-fairy way, if you like. So she was certainly wouldn't have... Um, and mysticism gets used in a whole... That's why I gave you that quick down and dirty definition at the beginning, because mysticism does get used in many, many different ways. And there's a, I don't know if you know the letter from um, the, uh, now I can't remember if it's from Virginia Woolf to Gwen Raverett or the other way around, Gwen Raverett, the printmaker, uh, cousin, one of the Darwin family. And um, she says, there's a lot of mystic religion about, what's that all to do with, you know? So there is a kind of sense of, oh, what's going on here? And of course, of course, Bertrand Russell was in that sort of uh, milieu. So we could talk much more, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, but maybe at the reception. Good, because I'm sure you know lots. I mean, you know, I have that sense when you ask the question, you know lots about this. It would be lovely to hear it. Thank you. Hello, hello, Jonathan Mareska here, uh, second year MDiv. Uh, 
Um, as someone who's been in different uh, schools of theology, divinity schools, schools of theological formation, and talking about an, an issue that is often at the periphery, like you said, of the tradition of the institution of church, um, how, I have a broad question for you, how do you conceive of mysticism and experiential encounter of the divine in theological education and formation? <laughs> I think it, In two minutes or yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think it's I think it's obviously central. I'm gonna, <laughs> I think it's important. But then I am someone who is profoundly interested in lived religion, and I'm profoundly interested in the ways in which a practice often influences theology, even if that goes uh, unsaid or barely said. Right, so I'm interested in that relationship, and a lot of my work is about that. Which is okay. You might think this is so. That's a lot of what my first book was about. There's an apparently abstract debate about miracles and the Enlightenment. Well, I thought, hmm, hang on a minute. Um, so what I was trying to show in that book was that people's claims that they'd experienced miracles. I can't say whether they did or not. People's claims that they'd experienced miracles actually led to an enormous amount of interest, first amongst natural philosophers in the Royal Society, who tested them. And then philosophers started to get really interested, and then they started to write about miracles. Hey, it wasn't in a vacuum. So I'm very interested in the way in which seemingly, you know, um, abstract ideas in theology and philosophy emerge out of very distinct practical situations or people's religious practices or lived religion. So I don't know whether that necessarily answers your question, but that's where I am. And that's why I became a historian rather than a systematic theologian, because I was at the crossroads at, at the end of Harvard Div School. Was I going to be a systematician or was I going to be a historian? And I chose to be a historian kind of for that reason. So that's not a full answer, but you know. Yeah, yeah thanks for that uh, fascinating lecture. Catherine Tanner. Um, systematic theologian. <laughs> I, I'm good. I, I have a question. I think that's similar to the first one that you were uh, asked, that, and I would put it this way: it has to do with the, the kind of weight that you're putting on mysticism for universalism, openness to other religions, social justice warrior kinds of things. Because historically, I mean, it, on your definition of mysticism in terms of an experience of union with God, that you find that historically associated with all kinds of other things, especially in earlier periods, not associated with universal salvation, you know, kind of elitism. There are yep. a lot of conditions uh, to be met before one has an experience of this kind, et cetera. So I'm just wondering about the kind of connections that you're drawing between uh, what you're calling mysticism and all the rest of it, which seems quite important. Yes, that's another wonderfully big question, which we might discuss at the reception. But, but for, so for example, um, there are people, so if I just stick to the early, my early 20th century people, which might be an easier way of doing it. So there are people who go through a kind of journey about that, actually. So Evelyn Underhill would be one of them. So if you read mysticism, it's, she actually says to a woman called Marjorie Robinson, who's who translates all the German texts for her, could you take out any specific Christ language or anything like that? Because I want this to be available to everybody. 10 years later, she decides she's going to join the Church of England after all. She's not just a seeker. And in that seeking period, she thinks about being a Roman Catholic but doesn't become one, partly because of the um, attitude towards the modernists. But at that point, she writes very differently, very, very differently about mysticism and almost stops writing about it, actually. And so, for example, when she writes, she writes, look, yeah, this is a, Plotinus is not unlike some of the Christian mystics, but there's a big difference. For, for Plotinus, you know, Neoplatonic philosopher, he's just having, in some ways, a nice flight of fancy. But the incarnation makes every difference to a Christian mystic because you can never get away from the fact that if you have that, you've then got to go and act on it. That it's rooted, that there's something rooted in the here and now. The incarnation is about, you know, <laughs> God with us. So you, 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 you have, you're therefore impelled to, to um, do something for the crowd, I think is the exact language she uses. So that's not, 
a precise answer to your question, but I am trying to say that there are, I've presented, I particularly, ju I just chose this topic today because I think, who are some interesting people I could talk about and make a point? And so you've got both, you know, you've both asked me questions in a way that are, are saying I might be slightly skewed and in a way it is slightly skewed because I've chosen some people who are interested in social justice from a particular angle. That's right, yes, you're right. <laughs> um, from the left, if you like. But there are people who are narrower or who want to say, you know, Christian mysticism is this, and I'm not really open to that. So yes, there are those people. I'll just give you Evelyn Underhill, who's a benign version of that, yeah. I'm sorry that's not a full answer to your question, but I hope it's a bit of an answer. 